Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, pardon my cat who is uh, attending me at the moment. <laughs> this is Wash. He is, he is my convention friend. Um, so today I am going to be presenting a very exciting lecture. Uh, please feel free to type questions into the chat and I will be available afterwards in the Discord to answer questions as well. Um, but if, if you are here, You'll, you'll see the tail sometimes if, if he if he goes down he'll come back up um, <laughs> if you are here I hope you are here for sprint to the finish completing a novel in a short time frame and uh, what I'm going to start doing now is sharing my screen this um, file is also available I'm going to give you a link so that you can download it for your very own and let me go get that link quickly so that I can put it in the chat. And come on, Link. Sorry, websites sometimes are slow. And here you all go. All right. And so getting my PowerPoint up, sharing screen. Share. Okay, hope you can all see this because I'm doing it as hard as I can. Okay, so sprint to the finish. Here we are. This is me. I'm Valerie Valdez. I'm the author of Chilling Effect and Prime Deceptions. The forthcoming third book, Fault Tolerance, will be out uh, in 2022. I'm also the author of a lot of short fiction and poetry. If you head to my website, candleandcentral.com, uh, valerievaldez.com also redirects there, then you can find more things that I am responsible for having written. All right, so typical novel lengths. These are, of course, fully negotiable. Um, there are always exceptions, and this does not include novellas or novelettes or other forms. But typically speaking, uh, depending on your genre, fantasy is going to be about 80,000 to 130,000 words, science fiction, 80 to 120, horror, 50 to 100, young adult, 50 to 80, middle grade is going to be typically a little shorter. Again, all very negotiable. We are only uh, including this for the purposes of planning, as you will see uh, in forthcoming slides. So what we're doing here is we're planning a marathon. And in order to do so, you need to figure out what your pace is. What is your word count goal? What is your tracking metric? How fast do you write? And how much time do you have? I use word count goals because it makes the math easier. You can use page goals if that works better for you. But for the purposes of this presentation, we will be doing word count. So math, oh no, I have ambushed you with math in this writing presentation. Um, if you are trying to write an 80,000 word novel in 60 days, then that is 1,333 words per day. Every single day you need to get up and write this many words. I know you're already taking deep breaths. It's okay, you can do it. Um, I'm sorry for attacking you with math. Now, if you don't like daily goals, let's say 10,000 words, that's how many you have to write every week if you want to write 80,000 words in eight weeks, which is approximately two months, which is about 60 days. Again, these are some approximations, but the goal here is for you to set your own timetable. This math is merely illustrating the point of how to do it, how to do the math, how to um, manage yourself. And again, if you want to do page counts, you can do page counts. And so you say to yourself, this is how many pages I want to write. This is how many days or weeks I have. And thus, this is how much I have to write for that amount of time. The reason I broke it out into day or week goals, you can break it into monthly goals if you want, but that tends to be a little bit harder to keep track of and keep an eye on. But some folks get very intimidated and overwhelmed by daily goals. And that's totally fine and reasonable. So you shouldn't feel like you must write every single day. Sometimes you may be be the kind of person who can write 3,000 words in one day but then can't write anything the next day. That's fine. You need to write in the way that works for you. So it may sound bananas. How do you write that much every day, every single day, or every single week, or however you break it down? But I will give you this not so secret tool, which unfortunately, again, doesn't work for everyone, but works for a lot of people, and you should try it. Sprints. You may have already heard about this. You set a timer for at least 10 minutes, no more than 60. And when that timer is on, you start writing and you do not stop until the timer goes off. You take a break for at least five minutes, uh, no more than 15 because you don't want to lose completely what, what your train of thought is. And then you just keep repeating this as many times as needed. Now, I say take a break for at least five minutes. This, in, this assumes that you are writing for a fixed period of time that is longer than that one sprint. Of course, you can do one sprint at a time and spread them out over the course of the day, in which case it's not that you're taking breaks, it's that you only have time for the one sprint. 
Well, that's fine. So how many sprints should you do? Well, you figure out what your word goal is, and over the course of doing sprints, you figure out what your average words per sprint are, and that dictates how many sprints you need to do in a day or in a week, again, depending on which metric you're using. So how do you do sprints? It's ideal if you schedule them in advance because then that way you have your time already parceled out so you're not just trying to find gaps of time during the day, which you can still do if you have it available, but ideally you want to have them scheduled in advance so you know when, when it's coming. Um, you can set aside one big block of time, two hours, three hours, one hour, whatever you've got, or you can fit them into the cracks of time throughout the day. Do one sprint in the morning, a sprint at lunch, or two sprints at lunch, depending on how long your lunch break is, um, and then the rest of your sprints in the evening. Or if you're writing over the course of the day because you are the fortunate kind of person who can write all day long, then you just spout it out wherever you want. Uh, during the sprint, no talking, no checking email, no texting, no tweeting. I have a list of uh, apps at the end that you can use to help yourself if you have weak willpower, but uh, ideally you want to focus on the writing during that time. Uh, during the break, you can do whatever you want. You can check the email, you can go on Twitter, you can do whatever you need to do, return calls. But again, it depends on the length of your break. You may not want to start anything that is going to be so long that it is going to distract from the beginning of your next thing. I, I recommend timing the breaks as well, just so that you know, oh, the break's over and I need to get back to work. Um, the blocker program, like I mentioned, if you need it to keep to keep you focused, definitely use it. And that goes for your phone or your computer. There's multiple programs available for the different platforms. And as you are beginning the process of doing sprints, it may not come naturally to you, which is fine. It may never work for you. That's also fine. Again, work with whatever your process is and whatever is best for you. But I do recommend trying it for at least a few days Try sprinting for different amounts of time. See how many words you get in each of those just to get a feel for how many words is good for you uh, per sprint and how, how long your attention stays focused. And that can change from day to day as well. So one day you may be able to do 15, 20, even 30 minute sprints. And the next day you may find that 10 minutes is the most that you can account for. And that's fine. Just whatever works for you. That is the key here. You have to listen to yourself and your own emotions and go with that. So. Are you a plotter or a pantser? This will affect how you proceed. You're probably both, that's okay. Um, and this is not intended as any kind of a judgment. This is simply for your own knowledge and preparation purposes. Um, plotter can also be called an architect. You will typically plan your book in advance, have a detailed outline, have a good working knowledge of your characters, thorough notes about your setting. If you're a pantser or a gardener, you prefer to make things up as you go, and often you will find that prep work is very stifling or counterproductive. It, a lot of people who are pantsers will say that if I try to outline something, it feels like I've already written it, and then I don't want to write it anymore. That's very valid. So just, again, know that about yourself. Know how much prep work you're able to manage and go with it. Um, the best way is always the one that works for you. That's it. If you're a plotter, before you start, try to create character profiles and you don't have to use existing lists or anything like that. Just again, whatever character profile method works for you. You can find one that someone's already made. You can make your own, go with it. Um, relevant details about your setting. You can make a wiki if you need to. That's what I like to do. Uh, outline your plot. Again, there are many different ways to outline. I have a whole separate thing about how to outline. Um, and just pick the outline method that is that works with you. Uh, consider what your themes are because themes can help you um, kind of pick the rug that ties the room together. And uh, pick a POV. You may have multi POV. That's fine too. Determine your structure if you're able to do so because that's sort of the shape of the story that you're going to, you know, pour the contents into. And having that uh, arranged in advance can make it much easier for you if you know you want so many chapters, if you know that you want to alternate POVs and so on and so forth. That will help dictate how you tell the story and having that set in advance helps you go faster. Um, but basically, if you're a plotter, you just prep as much as you can in advance. If you're a pantser, you just do however much prep is comfortable, which may be none, and that's fine. Um, just write down any random ideas you have about the story. Try to keep them together in one place if you can, one journal or one note file on your computer or on your phone or wherever. Again, whatever works for you. Uh, you can try some exploratory writing to get into the groove. Some people like to interview their characters. Some people like to almost like write fan fiction of their own stuff that it's not going to necessarily go into the book, but is going to come before it or after it or somewhere just to get a feel for their characters. 
um, figure out how to start your first scene. Because if you have a feel for that before you begin as a pantser, then at least that's kind of the in that you need to get started. And um, fan casting your characters can be really fun. And you'll note that some of these things can be fun for plotters as well. So don't feel like, again, you don't have to segregate the two things. You can mix and match whatever works for you. Uh, but fan casting can be super fun. Who, who do you picture when you're picturing these characters? And again, you can do no, I'm not your mom. I'm not going to watch you do this. So do whatever amount of prep is good for you. Um, anyone before you begin, this is going to sound probably painful to some people, but, but really, you know, prepare yourself for the long haul. The goal for this is you are trying to write an entire novel in a short period of time, be it a few weeks, a month, a couple of months. So you want to have as much preset as possible. Um, buy bulk groceries, you know, canned goods, pasta, stuff that you can make quickly and then won't go bad quickly. Uh, if you can make, free, make and freeze meals or make menus for yourself, that's good. Anything that can front load the decision making process so that later you don't have to sit around going, oh, uh, and using your precious brain space to try to do these tasks. Um, you want to make it so that the writing portion of your day, you know, some people use the phrase chop wood and carry water, where it's just like you just get into it and you get into the groove quickly. You don't have to do too much thinking. Uh, do all your laundry. You can also maybe pick your clothes in advance if you're super, you know, gung ho about that. Uh, clean your house really well, because if you are so focused on getting your word count and you don't have a ton of time, spare time to do it in, chances are you're going to have to let other stuff go. And if you're me, it's housework. Um, <laughs> So clean up, clean up, clean up. Uh, make a schedule in advance of stuff that you already know is coming, whether it be birthdays, holidays, homework, exams, any chores that you know you are going to have to do. And so you just, just make a, a calendar if you can, or put it in a planner, put it in your phone, whatever works for you, whatever method you use. But try to schedule that stuff all out in advance so that, again, you don't have any surprises coming up because surprises will happen. There's, there's only so much you can do. And tell your friends and family, see ya. Um, you're, because yes, you can still socialize, but again, the, the goal here is to just very, very, you know, carefully focus on producing this thing in a short time. And sometimes that will preclude socializing and um, a lot of the other stuff that you would do normally that would be distracting in this, in this scenario. Some speed boosters. And you can do these daily or weekly or, you know, before every session, but um, just things that will tend to make you go faster. Uh, summarize what you're writing for that day in the morning or before you first start writing. Just take about 10 minutes, basically the equivalent of one sprint to write a paragraph summary or make a list of the points that you want to hit. Just some sort of summary so that everything that's in your head is now on paper somewhere and you know where you're going. You have kind of a map. Um, in advance, figuring out when and where you are most productive is really good because then that way you can try to make yourself work in those places and at those times. If you know that you write best in the morning, ideally you want to try to set your sprints up for the morning. If you know you work best at night, you want to try to have them set up for night. If you work best in the afternoon, same deal. It's basically just a matter of figuring out what your uh, method and your routine are and what kind of space you need, whether you need a quiet space, whether you need a louder space, which I'm not sure how you would simulate at this point uh, if you're if you're quarantined at home there's cafe noise websites and apps and stuff that you can do and also just get hyped about what you're going to write uh, you know joy in writing is so precious and sometimes rare and I feel like it's really important because the more hyped that you are about the scene you're going to write the easier it will be for you to write it find a way to make it fun find a way to make it exciting if that means putting in easter eggs that no one will know about but you if that means just giving yourself a little dare before you get started trying to use certain words or something whatever works again just try to not approach it as drudgery as sadness um, that is the surest way to kill any pleasure that you'll get out of it and to make it harder for yourself. So random writing tip, um, Pinterest is a great place to find images that you can refer to later for descriptions. Uh, make a novel, you know, Pinterest board and pin a bunch of stuff so that when you're like, oh, you know what, I think I need maybe some kind of a concert hall or something. You can go back and be like, oh, let me just grab this picture. And it makes it easier for you to describe it as opposed to having to pull everything out of your head when maybe you're blanking in the moment. 
Making a list of names and for people and places in advance is also really helpful. I like to use random name generators, but I also like to mix and match. And I always try to Google everything in advance so that I don't accidentally name things after existing people or places if I'm writing a secondary world fantasy or sci-fi where that wouldn't be reasonable. Otherwise, I try to make lists of names for people and places that would make sense <laughs> within the context of the real world or um, you know, the sci-fi world that I'm working in. And so keeping two lists of names is good, used and available, because that way you are organizing yourself. You have the ones that you have already used and the ones that you can use. And if you've already used them, it's good to have them set up because then you can also keep track of, you know, the whether the names sound too similar to each other. So you don't have a Karen and a Kaylin and a Kaysen. And then the next thing you know, you have to do a quick find and replace throughout the document and whoopsie, you do something terrible. So when you actually get started with the writing process, I break this down into thirds because I find that this is roughly the trajectory that writers take as they are working their way through a novel, especially very quickly. These emotions can often play out the same way over the longer haul, but they tend to be more concentrated when you're trying to write a novel very fast. So act one, <laughs> roll for initiative. How will you feel? There are different kinds of people and it depends on the kinds of success that you're having as you are engaging in this intense project. Uh, if you're doing really well, you're gonna be excited. You are meeting and seeing your word goals. The story is just flowing as the spice must flow. Or you're doing okay, you know, you're making it or you're close. It's, it's harder than you thought it would be, but you're still, you know, you're committed. Um, or mediocre. Uh, you're, you're, you immediately get behind, you're discouraged, you, you will not ride in Valhalla, shiny and chrome, as they say in Fury Road. Um, but regardless of how you feel, these are, these are sort of the, the typical range of emotions that you're going to be experiencing right when you're starting out in the first third of your novel. This is both the easiest and the hardest time. It can be easy because you start out with a lot of enthusiasm, which can help, you know, with inertia. But if you do fall behind, it feels like, wow, I couldn't even get through the first third. I'm never going to make it. I'm never going to catch up. But you can. You can always catch up. You know, forgiving yourself is one of the first things that you can do. You can do it every day if necessary. Forgiving yourself for, for being imperfect and for producing a first draft, which is never going to be ideal. Um, so stay focused, try to meet your goals, whether they're daily or weekly, just, just try to stay on target. Uh, if you have the energy in this, in this first third of the novel, try to push yourself to write beyond your goals because chances are your energy is going to flag later. And again, this depends on you. This depends on the experience that you're having, but typically speaking, you know, Try to, try to, if you can, overwrite in the beginning, because that's the time when you're more likely to be able to do so, when you'll be emotionally kind of fortified for it. Um, take advantage of the days that you don't work to do extra sprints, whether it be weekends or if, you're, if your schedule is more sporadic than that. Just whatever extra time you have that you don't have to devote to your family or your chores or what have you, try to just slip in an extra sprint or two. You know, just a couple a day can make a big difference. And always reward yourself. Whatever reward works for you, whether it be, you know, food or video games or, you know, a good book or something, work in a time for rewards and work in a kind of reward. And you can have small rewards for meeting different milestones and you can have a big reward that you're holding out for at the end. But again, it is what works for you. Some people also prefer to sort of pre-treat themselves and that helps them, you know, work better. My son often likes that. Uh, so I'll give him, a you know, a glass of mango juice before he gets started working on something hard and that gives him the motivation to succeed. Um, writing with friends is much harder these days of course but if you can do it get on Zoom, get on Google, um, whatever Google is using these days, Google Voice, Google Hangouts. Um, hang out with your friends as much as you can, socially distanced maybe somewhere outdoors and and just commiserate, get on Discord, get on Slack encourage each other because it, it is a long slog even if you're doing it very quickly and having someone support you for the long haul is great. Keep in mind that you don't have to write everything in order. If you're stuck, you can absolutely skip around. You know, if, if you're bored, if you're overwhelmed, if you know there's a thing that you definitely really want to write and it will give you the energy to keep going, then skip to that. You can tie it together later and you'll be okay. Hold on, I'm seeing uh, something in the chat. So I'm just gonna real quick beep. Apparently I have to do this.
Oh, no, that didn't help. All right, never mind. I'm sorry, whoever put something in the chat. I will come back to it later and I will answer all questions um, at the end. All right. So the middle, so this is roughly the middle third. Sometimes this starts as early as the 20% mark in your novel or the 25% mark. Um, sometimes it starts later, 30 to 40%. But essentially the middle of the novel is one of the hardest parts for writers. And it's one of the easiest places to abandon it or get discouraged or start feeling really bad about yourself. Um, maybe you're in, in the lucky few who are still doing amazing and excited and you're hitting your word count and everything is great and also all of you in despair. Um, other people probably hate you, but in a very fond and, and proud way. Uh, if you're on track or close to it, you know, you, you are persisting, you're, you're getting it done, you know, that's awesome. A lot of people, again, this is a time to get discouraged. You fall behind. You may have already given up at this point on this project. You're watching Netflix and maybe you'll come back to this novel someday when you're feeling better about life. This is actually very normal, extremely normal low point. It happens to virtually everyone. Um, if you're a plotter, you start second guessing your plans. If you're a pantser, you feel like I can't, I can't think anymore. Your brain is just not helping. Uh, this is where family and friends start to feel very slighted. And what do you mean you don't have time to go hang out? And what do you mean that you're not making dinner tonight? Um, or you start getting new plot bunnies showing up and distracting you and making you feel like, oh, but I could be writing this other thing instead that is shiny and fresh and not sucky like the thing I am working on. But how do you fix that? How do you get around it? If you're a plotter, go back to your outline, modify it as needed, um, do whatever needs doing to reacquaint yourself with the joy of your novel. Pantsers, start stockpiling more dares, more prompts, more characters, things that will be generating new imaginative ideas. Find, find ways to lure yourself into continuing and keep rewarding yourself and keep resting as needed. The rest is good and important, even though this is a very arduous process. Uh, you do need to give yourself some time to recuperate whenever possible. And, and celebrate what you've done. And just, again, re reconnect with the thing that made you want to write this in the first place. Whatever excitement pushed you towards this idea and, and made you want to go. Um, again, using brackets as a placeholder, if you can't think of something, is excellent. Because then you can always come back later and deal with whatever needs dealing with. And uh, no one will know. No one, when they are holding your book in their hands at, in a bookstore somewhere, will have any clue that you wrote it out of order or that you filled in a blank like a, like a terrifying Mad Lib. And if you need to change something, um, just write forward as if you've already changed it. Now, this assumes, of course, that you're writing in order, but it, the, the goal here is to produce a first draft without getting snagged on revision because it's very easy to feel like you need to stop and edit and fix and tweak and change, but chances are if you are on a strict deadline and you are trying to write very quickly, you don't have the time to do that. And so just make a note to yourself of the thing that needs to be changed and keep writing as if you have already changed it. You will fix it later. And again, no one will know. No one will know that you fixed it later. They will only have the final result. So the last third of this, this arduous, grueling process. How will you feel? If, if, you, if you make it to the end, you'll be excited, you'll be psyched, you've written a novel, you are amazing, and you have, you have taken down this epic raid, epic raid boss, and now you, now you may loot the corpse for, for all ex, exciting gear. Um, or chances are that you are just, you're fine, you're okay, you, you maybe finished it or you got really close to your, your word goal, your page count goal, and you are just, you are wiped out. It is very normal if you are writing so much so quickly to feel just drained, utterly drained by the end of it. And you may be really disappointed in yourself if you ended up not getting nearly as close as you thought you would to writing the full novel. But even if you didn't, even if you only wrote a few thousand words, even if you only wrote a couple of chapters, that is probably still more than you would have written otherwise. And so you really need to, again, forgive yourself, cut yourself some slack. You know, you, you did good and you can always come back to it. That's the other thing is that, you know, life can intrude, life can make a nuisance of itself and cause problems that you could not possibly have anticipated. And so it's, it's not useful to feel like a failure 
it is useful to say to yourself, okay, it, I, it didn't work out this time, but that doesn't mean I have to stop. It means that I can pick it up later and keep going whenever. It means that I can try again when I have more time, when I have more energy, when life is not sucking, and I, I can make it happen. Or it's possible you can slow down and just do it over a longer period of time. Even if you just write a couple hundred words a day, you can definitely write a novel in a year. I mean, it's, it's not something that you have to do all at once. Um, obviously, the purpose of this workshop is to help you do it all at once, but uh, it's not mandatory. So do do things at your own pace. It's better to do it slow and steady and get to the end um, than to give up and move on. So the, the momentum of this, it, it can either carry you along like a wave once you start getting to the end. It can feel like you're, you're going downhill and it just turns into a tumble and, and you make it down to the bottom. Or if you start missing days or weeks, you know, if your goals start slipping, you may feel like you can never uh, get back up and you can never, you know, get to the end. Um, things often do slow down. So for some people, they speed up. For some people, they slow down. And you just start feeling very hesitant, very worried. Oh my gosh, I'm almost at the end. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Um, at this point, just do your best to continue balancing your obligations in your writing time. Uh, at this point, you can change up where you write if you can and see if that helps you kind of shake out of any doldrums you may be in. Continue to reward yourself for every milestone that you complete. If, if it's daily, if it's weekly, whatever works for you. Sprint. Don't, you know, if, if you if you wake up one day and you're like, I can't write today, just promise yourself to do one sprint. That's it. And the beauty of just doing one sprint and committing to doing that one sprint is you can tell yourself, all right, I only have to do one. And if I do that one and I still am not feeling it, I'll stop and I'll go do something else. And you in doing that, you know, deal with yourself, you are giving yourself an out. But often what happens is that once you get yourself to do that one sprint, chances are good you'll keep going you will you will have overcome that initial inertia and you will be able to do more sprints after that but if you don't if you try the sprint and it just doesn't work and the words aren't coming it's not happening then you say okay i'll try again later or i'll try again tomorrow and you did try and that's you know that's how you can kind of tell the difference between you know is is this just normal inertia that i can overcome by by giving it a try or is this something a little more deep uh, deep seated that it's not, you know, there are people who will tell you just push through it and you'll get through and no, no, that that one push will be enough to tell you whether there's a difference between, oh, I can push through this and I need to take a break. And one of the last things, don't pre stress about what happens next. It's also tempting to start getting fixated on, oh, I have to make my website or get my social media lined up, or, oh my gosh, I'm gonna have to edit so much. Oh no, what am I have to do? I have to find beta readers, I have to do this, I have to do that. Get the draft done first, focus on that, focus your, your emotional time and energy and attention on just getting it done because all that stuff will keep. Um, stressing about it in advance, I think some folks call it borrowing trouble. It, it does you no good. And no matter what you do, no matter whether you succeed, don't succeed, meet your goal, don't meet your goal, just be proud of yourself for whatever you accomplish here. I know it sounds very millennial to be like, yay, participation trophy. But seriously, you know, I, I think that we often lose track of how challenging this can be to do. And so making sure that you are proud of yourself and are reveling in, in whatever you've done is, is actually really good and I think emotionally helpful and rewarding and encouraging to yourself. Um, whenever you get stuck, brainstorm, brainstorm, brainstorm. It's, this is one of the most essential tools in our true box, and it's one of the first that we will forget to use. We'll just sit there and get stuck and, oh no, what am I doing? What am I doing? But brainstorming, you know, you can do it with friends, you can do it by yourself, but it often gets you out of a rut when you just have your, you know, your wheel is just churning in the mud. So what, what do you do? How do you brainstorm in case you have forgotten or were never given any sort of instructions on how to do so? Um, get a timer like you're doing a sprint and just free write. Whether you're doing it in a notebook or on a computer, um, you know, pen and paper or just stray napkin in a bar. Well, probably not anymore in a bar, hopefully. Maybe you have a bar in your house, but, um, but set the timer for probably about 10 to 15 minutes. Again, it can be as long as a half an hour if you want and just write down 
all your ideas. Um, interrogate yourself. Start with just what question, you know, what are you stuck on? What is the thing that you're trying to figure out? What are you trying to answer? And just focus on coming up with as many different options as possible. You know, just, just again, take all ideas, write them all down, no matter how foolish they seem. Because a lot of times when you're having this kind of stuck moment, um, you feel like there's no answer to the problem. You've written yourself into a corner. You're not going to be able to do anything. And so, sitting down and forcing yourself to find a solution just you know challenging yourself and saying i must do this thing for this period of time a lot of times again it will just it, it will make your brain kick into gear and be like oh well i guess i can't get away with not doing this um it can also help to bounce back and forth with a buddy uh, you, you state your problem, you go back and forth with someone until you find the solution that fits. I, I have a lot of friends that I do this with, and it really is invaluable. And sometimes it's just a rubber duck thing where you're more or less talking to yourself and they'll, they'll occasionally ask a question or they might not ask anything. But again, just writing down or talking out the thing, sometimes that's all it takes to get your brain to be like, oh, I know what I need to do now. Um, I've done this with so many people where I've just gabbed at them and then I will say, oh, I, I figured it out and they haven't said a word. <laughs> so it, it, it doesn't necessarily require back and forth, but either way it can work. Um, but, but again, accept all the ideas that come to you. Don't reject them because that's the place where you start to feel like you're cornered and trapped and there's no solution is when you are rejecting the ideas that your brain is giving you. But the more that you write down, the more options that you have. And sometimes, you know, you'll get to the 10th option and something completely random based on something you had already written will pop into your head and that will be the solution. So now tools of improvisation. This is um, not just for pantsers, even though it can definitely help pantsers, but even plotters can get stuck. Even if you have a really great outline, even if it's extremely detailed, uh, you may need a little something to kind of goose you into action if you if you get slowed down. So some ways to improvise and, and do that kind of thing. Using random generators anytime that you get stuck. There are so many different generator websites out there for names and places and plot twists and objects and you know just there there are so many ways that you can use random generators to incorporate a sense of well randomness into your story but also to give you an idea when you are stuck when you are lodged somewhere you know you you can find the name of a new sci-fi gadget or some new fantasy potion or book or something. And that can be all that it takes to get you unstuck and get you moving again. Uh, taking dares from family, friends, people on social media. Um, when, you, when you incorporate these elements of randomness into your story, often what happens is it's kind of like grit in an oyster and your brain really wants to make sense of stuff. Brains are pattern recognizing creatures. And so when you give them some weird thing and say, all right, brain, stick this in my novel somewhere, your brain will usually kick into gear and try to actually make it work. And so having that random stuff can, can again, get you out of a rut or take you to interesting places that you maybe hadn't considered before. And dares are one form of doing that, being dared to insert a particular character or have a particular moment, maybe use a trope or something like that. It, it can take your story in interesting new directions, or it can make the things that you already have be richer, deeper, more thematically resonant. Uh, go for a walk if you can and write about anything you see. I don't take too many walks anymore in my area, but uh, maybe your area is, is more um, comfortable to walk in right now. Uh, you can also just look around your room, pick an object and throw it into the story. Some decorative element, some you know book that you can see, uh, one of your pets, someone in your family, uh, some item from your cabinets, just any random thing. You can try to integrate it into whatever scene you're writing at any given moment. Uh, you can have a character tell a story within a story. You don't want to overuse that particular <laughs> option, but it can be very fun to just have a character share an anecdote from their childhood, from uh, some experience that they had that's related to the scene that you're writing. It can, again, enrich not just the world, but the character and give more background to them, more depth and uh, explore who they are a little bit more. 
Uh, locking two opposing characters in a room together can be exciting. And hey, it worked for Die Hard, right? You you take your villain, you take your protagonist, and you shove them into one spot and make them figure out what to do. Or even just two characters who are um, allies but are somehow fighting, having some conflict, and force them to work it out, basically. Whether it be the old, oh, we're snowed in, or, you know, uh, we're, we have to stay at this inn and there's only one room, so we have to share it. There's a lot of ways to, to jam people into a room, maybe on a spaceship. Oh no, we have to go hide in the cargo bay together because of reasons. Just stick them together and make them hash things out. Um, this is, I, I call this the operative question. What's the worst thing that could happen? it happens. And sometimes you have to sit down and brainstorm a list of the worst things that can happen before you hit on what is the actual possible worst thing that can happen. But um, go for it. Try to figure it out. And when I say worst thing, you can replace worst with whatever is appropriate for your story. It may be what is the most embarrassing thing that could happen. It may be what is the funniest thing that can happen. It may be what is the most dramatic thing that can happen. So it doesn't have to be necessarily the worst in terms of the harshest or most unforgiving or something like that. Just replace worst with whatever sort of thematic or tonal or atmospheric thing is appropriate to your story. Uh, and again, when in doubt, write it out. Just brainstorm. Try to tell yourself the story somehow as, as if you were recounting to someone else or just talk it out with someone else directly. And a lot of times that will help you figure out how to get to the next bit if you're stuck or how to get unstuck from wherever you are. So for further reading, uh, some books that I like to recommend, uh, Wonder Book by Jeff Vandermeer, which is, I actually, I've got my, I have two copies of it because there is a revised and expanded edition now, but this is a really beautiful book. It's pretty inexpensive actually for what it is. It has a lot of really amazing illustrations and writing exercises, and a lot of it is extremely useful and um, highly, highly, highly recommend. Good for not just getting unstuck when you are stuck, but also for prepping. Um, Writing the Other by Nisi Shawl is amazing. Steering the Craft by Ursula K. Le Guin. And I like The Kick-Ass Writer by Chuck Wendig as well. And then, so links. Links. I will try to put these in the chat or in the Discord so that you um, can have them readily available to you if you did not grab this presentation. Forest is an app that can be used on your computer or your phone in order to basically uh, provide not just a sprint timer, but also a thing that will lock you out of your devices. Uh, Freedom also lets you lock out of things. Write or Die is a website that you can write on like a word processor, and there are different modes that you can use. There are modes that will give you cat pictures when you've written a certain number of words. There are modes that will start Start deleting your words if you stop writing for a certain amount of time. I never use that mode. That scares me. I don't want to lose words. Um, but that is one tool that you can use and put it in your arsenal if you need to be prompted. Uh, Fantasy Name Generators is a generator website that I highly recommend. They have way more than name generators. They have story generators, object generators, calendar generators. There's all sorts of stuff on there. Seventh Sanctum also is a great generator website. Uh, again, lots of different stuff that you can generate there. And if you really, really, really want to punish yourself or give give a, part a very particular format uh, structure a whirl, how to write a novel in three days. And that particular approach is championed by Moorcock and it definitely involves pre-planning um, and it is a very formulaic approach, but it will get you a novel in three days if you just sit down and do nothing else and someone else makes your food for you. So once again, I am Valerie Valdez. You can find me at candleandsunshine.com or valerievaldez.com. On Twitter, I am Valerie Valdez. On Facebook, Valerie Valdez Author, also on Instagram. And again, you can buy my books, Chilling Effect and Prime Deceptions, both written in very short time periods as well. Um, and then edited at a slight longer <laughs> leisurely pace. Um, which is okay too. <laughs> uh, I also am a NaNoWriMo municipal liaison, so I've been doing this for about 15 years or so, and if anyone feels the need to ask questions, I, I will be on Discord after this, but right now I'm going to get out of screen sharing mode, pause share, 
um, trying to unshare actually. Mm. Should be at the very top of the screen. Yeah, I'm trying to, it to says, stop it for you. It just says new share, but yeah, if you can stop it, that'd be great. Thank you. Woo -hoo. All right. So, <sighs> okay. Um, yeah, Discord writing groups work really well. I'm trying to just scroll through for any questions because we have about five more minutes. So, um, yeah, there are Discord bots. Uh, uh, Talos is one, and um, Dino is another good bot for uh, doing time sprints. It, depending on the discords that you're in, you may be able to do sprints with other people or just use that particular bot to time your sprints for you. And a lot of those bots, some of them uh, you can set up uh, like preset word goals. It can track for projects as well, or it can just be something where, you know, if you want to do like a word war or race against someone else, and then you each put in your word count at the end of the sprint, and then you can see who won. Uh, I don't like to be competitive like that personally, but if that gets you going, then it's a great idea. Um, yeah, Danger Notes is a good app too. Uh, there's another one called... Uh, I forgot, um, but if you if you look, there are a lot of different apps that will kind of lock you out of stuff. Um, and then again, you can you can definitely review all of this uh, online because this is being recorded. Yeah, Sprinto and WriterBot um, is used on the Dream Foundry Discord. Dream Foundry is a great organization. They have a con that they put together as well as different contests. And so if you can check out their website, uh, you can join that community also. And they it's a super encouraging writing community, super recommend it. Um, does anyone have any questions for me? <laughs> I know that I speak very, very quickly, which is why I put the link for the uh, download of this in the chat immediately, because I figured, oh, no, I will talk too fast. And then people will be like, what did she say again? <laughs> so, yes. Any, any questions about anything, any, any problems that you tend to have when you try to write quickly, any, any things that I can solve for you? Um, any way that I can help. And thank you, Crystal, I, I appreciate it. I, <laughs> I tried to speak clearly even as I speak quickly, but I am from Miami and so this is what happens. So I guess I have a question. When, sure. when is this technique, is it, is it better used at certain times than others or is it just a, an approach maybe for all of the books you wanna do so you can get that first draft done quickly and then do the revision? I think it definitely depends on you as a person and what your goals are and what you're trying to accomplish. And so um, as a NaNoWriMo participant, every November, every April, and every July, I sit my butt down and I um, try to write 50,000 words, give or take, in one month. And so I've been doing that for, like I said, about 15 years, definitely every November. Usually my goals in April and July are a little bit different. They're either a little bit slower or I'm editing during those months. Um, this is a technique that I recommend particularly for people who can't seem to finish stuff. I'll be honest. Yeah, it's, it's if you find that you keep trying to start things and then never getting it done, I, I would give this a shot. Um, but I would say that there are a lot of writers that do write very quickly. And it's good to try to do it, even if only as a one-time challenge to yourself. If you end up ever wanting to do like IP work, that can often be on very, very tight deadlines. So just having the practice of doing it. Um, I have not always written this way. I started writing this way when I started doing NaNoWriMo uh, many, many moons ago. Um, and so this is basically years of accumulated techniques and knowledge and experience through both uh, success and failure. <laughs> um, dialogue, I, I think I will take that to the Discord because yeah, I don't know that I have quick tissue dialogue, but it is a thing that I love doing. Uh, if you're not sure if you're if you're if you're writing a novel or a short story, look for the writing excuses mice quotient information. Mary Robin at Kowal and writing excuses. She has a formula that tries to help you figure out the length of the thing that you're writing. And so, go try to look for that. It's the writing excuses podcast has it. Mice quotient. I think they may have changed it to mace. But if you search for either, she has a literal formula to tell you roughly what she would expect your length is going to be. There was also a question from D.L. Hill that may have scrolled past you. Yeah, let me see. Um, oh yeah, no, that's what I was saying when, did I always write this way? Yeah, no, I mean, like I said, it's, it's 
the way that I started writing novels, because when I was writing my first novel, it was a nano project. It was something that I came out of college writing poetry, actually, that I did poetry thesis in college. And I had written short fiction before that, but never something as long as a novel. And so when I saw National Novel Writing Month as a thing, I was like, oh, I'm going to give that a try. That could be fun. I'm still doing it. Obviously. <laughs> I'm doing it professionally now. So that's even more fun. Um, and I do love it. So uh, yeah, <laughs> thank you for the, the, the link in um, Evergreen just put it there for choosing a length. I definitely recommend taking a look at that. It's not a hard and fast thing, but it will give you some guidelines, something to work with in trying to figure out how long will this be. You can force stuff to be different lengths. You can take something that's a short story. My ch chilling effect was a short story and everyone was like, I'd love to read more about this. And I went, oh, okay, I guess. And I had created sort of a, a crew with their own stories and I was able to expand it out because it did make sense for that, that I was able to contextualize the thing that was happening and kind of blow it up into a full a full novel and now it's going to be a full trilogy so you can definitely go from short to long it's i think harder to go from long to short but essentially what you do is you just add or subtract elements you add or subtract characters locations plot lines subplots uh, or you simplify and take them out and so you can play around with it but there are some things that just kind of will feel to you like they need to be a certain length all well, right. thank you. Yeah, I, we're just about done here. So I was going to say, all right, heading over to the Discord. All right, thanks everyone so, so, so much for coming. And if you have any other questions, hit me up online, on the Discord, on Twitter, wherever you can find me, I am here to help. Thank you so much. Thank you, Crystal. And thanks everyone. Thank you.